Hey there, once again, YouTube. Ben Ferriogo coming at you with a few things today. In Washington State, we had an aftershock near the Monroe area from the magnitude 4.6 that woke me up in the middle of the night. I did not feel this aftershock. It was a 2.5 at 29.8 kilometers in depth around 10.44 uh, a.m. Pacific Time this morning, July 14, 2019. Uh, I believe I would have felt it if I was paying attention. Maybe I did feel it. I don't know. We were just really active, walking around a lot, you know, getting ready for the morning. So it's possible I did feel this and didn't know, uh, notice it. But I did feel the 2.0 aftershock that occurred yesterday. I believe that was yesterday. I think that was yesterday morning or yesterday afternoon, excuse me, that I felt the 2.0 aftershock. So I should have felt this one if I was paying attention, but I wasn't. So... And over here we have 2.0 at 25.6 kilometers in depth. A lot of earthquakes occurring between 20 and 30 kilometers in depth lately, specifically in this area in Washington State right here. And that's it for Washington State. Nothing too, too crazy. Let's go to California. In the Ridgecrest area and coastal volcanic field area, we see earthquakes are definitely dying down. Not as much seismicity occurring right now as, as it was before. Only 706 of all magnitudes in the past 24 hours. We saw that number around 1,800 to 2,000 a few days ago per 24-hour period. So, definitely looks like seismicity is calming down very small magnitudes. The largest in the past 24 hours was a magnitude 3.5 at 1.8 kilometers in depth all the way up here. Then we had another 3.5 all the way down near Ridgecrest down here at 5.4 kilometers in depth. Then over here, the past seven days, all magnitudes, we saw on July 13, 2019, two earthquakes actually, 1.5 striking at 1.7 kilometers in depth at 6.30 UTC in central Maine, right over here. But we saw a very interesting magnitude 3.7 at 14.4 kilometers in depth at 17.56 UTC again on the 13th, right up here just to the north-northwest of Ottawa, Canada. Right in the middle of nowhere, basically. Let's take a look at that in Swarm, just real quick, from the closest seismic station, which would be this station right here, VLDQ, in the CN network in Canada, broadband vertical, dash dash location code. It was, uh, the arrival time for this earthquake was 27.1 seconds. This is the shortest arrival time I could find. So, this station is definitely far from the epicenter, but we still should get a good look at this magnitude 3.7. Nobody reported feeling it. Here we are in the seismic program swarm with data taken from the closest seismic station to the magnitude 3.7 near Ottawa, Canada. And we see it right here. Clear PNS wave arrivals showing about 27 seconds of arrival time. Took about 27.1 seconds to reach the station. So the PNS wave arrivals should be pretty separated here. Normal high frequencies. Normal tectonic event. It lasted a pretty good amount of time though. Look at how long that earthquake lasted. Look at the, the coda, the end tail of an earthquake. Look at that. That is a very long coda for a 3.7, at least in my opinion. What, that's a few minutes? Look at that. That's crazy. That is pretty crazy in my opinion. And then we saw a likely aftershock right here. Very tiny. I'm probably, probably going to say maybe a 1.5 or so. Very strange, very emergent, but definitely looks like an earthquake in my opinion. And that's that for right there. And let's move on. Here we are at earthquake.usgs.gov. We see here in Australia, near Western Australia, right in this bay part, if you if you want to call it that, we saw a magnitude 6.6. .6. All of them say 10 kilometers in depth. That is likely because USGS did not constrain the depths correctly. They do that a lot for earthquakes off the west coast along the Blanco Fracture Zone and stuff like that when they cannot constrain the depths correctly. They just slap on a 10 kilometers in depth sticker. So it definitely is possible it could have been deeper or more shallow than this, but we had a 6.6 .6 in Australia. Pretty good size for Australia, guys. Just right off the northwestern coast, right here. Then we had a 4.9, 4.5, and 4.5 after shots. Let's go to the event pages. Remember, Australia is not the United States. So really, a lot of people will not report to USGS because basically they did not, they don't, a lot of people don't know about USGS in foreign countries, guys. But, nevertheless, we saw 222 people send in a report to USGS that they felt this earthquake in Australia. There's the moment tensor right there. Scrolling down. No more information is given about it. Let's go to Did You Feel It? See where the people were when they felt this. Okay, so pretty much right along the coast and a little bit farther south right down here, people did feel it. A few people up near Darwin, Australia, up to the north. So nothing too, too crazy, guys, but we did see a 6.6. .6. And the fact that people were this close and reported light to moderate shaking shows me that this was pretty deep. 
I believe this was a lot deeper than 10 kilometers in depth. Because if it was more co closer to the surface, people closer to the epicenter would feel it much stronger. So it was probably pretty deep. Sadly, the closest seismic station is IUMBWA BHG 10. 46.1 seconds to arrive on this station. So this station was pretty, pretty far from the epicenter. Regardless, we're going to take it since it's the closest seismic station and look at it in the seismic program swarm. Now remember this 6.6 .6 struck at 539 UTC on the 14th. Here we are in the closest seismic station available. Here's 539. Remember it took about 40 seconds or so to arrive on this station. But we see right here, it's coming in on the monitor right here. Pretty strong earthquake. I have no frequency filter set on here at all. Pretty strong earthquake. Look at the amplitudes, guys. So I'm guessing this was pretty deep. I, I really do believe this was pretty deep. Let's add a 1 hertz high pass filter, shall we? There we go. That looks, looks a little more uniform. Some of the really low frequencies are gone out of there. Let's zoom this all the way out. Go to the spectrogram. Very strong earthquake, guys. Very strong. A lot of aftershocks involved. A lot of aftershocks. Many, many aftershocks, actually. So I'm pretty sure it's been a while since Australia has had an earthquake this large. Thank God it did not strike more shallow near the mainland. Otherwise, shaking would have been much worse. You can see there's a lot of aftershocks involved with this 6.6. .6. Very intriguing. Here's likely another aftershock right here, I believe. Yep. And very emergent. And a lot of these are very, very emergent, especially the 6.6, .6, which was emergent as well. I think that's pretty intriguing. Uh, so that's it for right there. Let's go to MCID, which I have up right here. And you see the magnitude 4.0 from Montana right there. Now, right here, remember, it takes many, many minutes to reach around the world. We got the 6.6, .6, which any anything above a 6.0 almost should show on every single seismic station in the world. It really, really should. Uh, right here, we do see the tail seismic signature for the magnitude 6.6. .6. If this isn't the teleseismic signature, then where is it? But we know it should be here somewhere, right? And we don't see it except for right here. So this is the teleseismic signature from the magnitude 6.6 .6 in Australia from MCID, which resides on the southwestern section of Yellowstone National Park. Now, not too much longer later, I believe only a few hours later, up here in Indonesia, notice this whole area is Indonesia, right here we saw magnitude 7.3 at 910 UTC, and the 6.6 .6 down here struck at about 539 UTC. So within about four hours of each other or so. Scrolling in. Let's see. We see a magnitude 5.1 in Indonesia right in here. But the majority of the seismicity is right here. <laughs> Look at how many aftershocks and how big they are, guys. 7.3, again, supposedly at 10 kilometers in depth. Shake map looks like it was pretty strong for the area. 4.9, 5.2, 5.2, 4.5, 5.8 which I believe was the largest aftershock of this. Multiple mid-range 4s and 5s with a few high 5 aftershocks. But we did see a magnitude 7.3 in Indonesia. Let's go to the event page, shall we? All right. Nobody reported feeling it. That's not surprising, but it was pretty strong, so definitely a lot of people felt it. Now check this out, guys. The July 14, 2019 magnitude 7.3 earthquake near the southern end of the island of Halmahera, sorry guys, Indonesia, occurred as the result of shallow strike slip faulting. Why have we been seeing so much strike slip faulting lately, guys? A lot of the mid-range to large earthquakes that we've been seeing lately, especially in California, have all been strike slip earthquakes. Why? Usually we should see oblique thrust or reverse thrust, right? We should see multiple different types of faulting, right? But a large majority I've been seeing of the seismicity lately has been strike slip faulting. Why? I, I personally, I have no idea. If you have an idea of what that could be, please let me know in the comments section below. It'd be good to get a uh, conversation going about this. But remember, I can't look at every single comment, so just shoot me an email if you have something important, please. In the complex plate boundary region of eastern Indonesia within the oceanic lithosphere of the Sunda Plate, 
Faulting mechanism solutions for the event indicate that slip occurred on a steeply dipping structure striking either southwest, right lateral faulting, or southeast, left lateral faulting. Aftershocks since the magnitude 7.3 event have generally aligned with the plane striking southeast. Tectonics in eastern Indonesia are extremely complex. Yeah, guys, they get smacked hard all the time. And are dominated by the most convergent interactions of the Pacific, Australia, Philippine Sea, and Sunda Plates. So they got four plates converging right there. That's one of the reasons why they have such a bad time with earthquakes and tsunamis. The edges of the Sunda and Australia plates are also often subdivided into smaller tectonic blocks, including the Molucca Sea and Bird's Head microplates in the region of the July 2019 earthquake. In this context, the July 2019 event most closely aligns with the boundary between the Bird's Head and Molucca Sea microplates, about 130 kilometers to the southeast. At depth beneath this earthquake and Molucca Sea in general, predominantly to the north and west of this event, the inverted U-shape of the Halmahera plate which has no surface expression, also plays a role in regional tectonics. At the location of the July 14th earthquake, the Sunda and Philippine scene plates are converging in an east-west direction at a rate of approximately 110 millimeters per year, and the Sunda, Sunda and Pacific plates are converging in an east-west direction at a rate of approximately 96 millimeters per year. We've seen 35 magnitude 6 events within 250 kilometers of the July 14th event in the last 50 years. None of these were magnitude 7 and above. Within the first three hours of the July 14, 2019 earthquake, the USGS has recorded 17 aftershocks in about a northwest-southeast direction, about the magnitude 7.3 shock. The largest of these was a 5.8, 33 minutes after the 7.3. Now we're going to take a look at this in the program Swarm from the closest seismic station, and then take a look at the teleseismic signature. It's always good to get familiar with teleseismic signatures, guys. TNTI in the GE network. Here we have TNTI in the GE network, which is the closest seismic station to this event in question. We see the magnitude 6.6 .6 signature from the Australia event shown right here. Here, let me turn on a 1 hertz high pass filter to the 8th power. There we go. Just to get rid of some of those lower frequencies, just real quick. This station only records data up to 10 hertz, as shown by the spectrogram plot and the waveform plots as well. Uh, let's zoom in, shall we? Here is the magnitude 7.3, pretty strong in Indonesia. Very, look at these little prongs right here. What are those? Very, very strange. I thought that was very interesting. Don't know what the heck that is. Uh, going forward, multiple aftershocks. Again, I believe this was a 5.8 aftershock right here. And then down here, we see multiple strong aftershocks around the uh, mid fours to mid five range, probably in the higher fives as well. Multiple aftershocks still ongoing. Let's go to the waveforms. Many, many, many aftershocks. And again, it's inter interesting to note that some of the major earthquakes above 6.5 usually look more emergent. I, I have always found that kind of odd because usually smaller earthquakes have clear PNS wave arrivals. You know, they strike very quick. But a lot of the major, major, major earthquakes, even up to 8.0, 9.0, they look more emergent, which I, I don't know why that is. I don't know. I'll have to talk to a seismologist about that. I don't know why. And this is probably like maybe magnitude 5 or so. Many aftershocks still continuing in the area after the 7.3 in Indonesia. All right, which is the largest earthquake, supposedly, in the past 50 years for that one area. So activity is kicking up in Indonesia and Australia, guys. Had some pretty good-sized quakes down there. Let's go to MCID for a second. Actually, wait, when did this occur? About 9-11 UTC. About 9-11 UTC. Let's, so let's see if we can find the teleseismic signature right here. It's about 9-11 UTC. So what that should take to get to Yellowstone National Park from Indonesia. I'm going to say maybe 15 minutes. I'm going to say maybe 15, 20 minutes. So let's, I'm pretty sure this is it right here. Yep. This is it right here. Because we don't see it really anywhere else. Could be this right here, but that's smaller. That could be from the 5.8 aftershock, possibly. But we do see the tell seismic signature right here of the magnitude 7.3 in Indonesia. Very low frequencies. Let's check out the spectra plot, shall we? Notice we see fre dominant frequencies between, I'm going to say, 0 0.1 hertz and 0 0.9 hertz. Definitely a tell seismic signature, that is for sure. So that's pretty much it right now, guys. How are you guys doing today? You having a good time? Oh, it looks like we possibly had a... Don't know what that is. That does not look like an earthquake, in my opinion. Very strange. I don't know. 
And here's the five, or excuse me, the 4.0 that struck Manhattan, Montana, shown on MCID right here, which I talked about last night. So that's pretty much it for today, guys. I hope you all have a great day. Let's see if any more earthquakes struck while I have been recording this. Let's go back to latest earthquake, shall we? I always like to check, just in case if something happened, guys. Just in case. Nope, not seeing much. Let's go to world. Nothing too crazy, except it looks like right down here in Somalia. We had a 5.0. Somalia is definitely not the place to live, guys. That is for sure. Hope you guys have a great day. God bless, and I'll talk to you later.